I want to talk you through what this means in terms of a patient. So this is a patient of mine that I love, Hermel. She's 53 years old. She came to see me because she was having epigastric abdominal pain. And she had already seen her primary care doctor. Like many of you, I'm sure, I get people when they wanted something different than they're getting from their regular doctor or because their regular doctor didn't succeed in helping them. Um, her regular doctor said, oh, you're having epigastric pain. Uh, you know, it happens occasionally. It lasts for a couple of hours. She did some tests, all normal, normal blood count, liver, amylase lipase. She did an ultrasound thinking, oh, maybe this is gallbladder disease, and she had gallstones. But obviously no, uh, no inflammation going on currently. The patient comes to me because the primary care doctor sent her to the general surgeon. She doesn't want to have surgery. So my job is to figure out what's going on with her abdominal pain. So here are the kinds of things that I asked. The character of the pain, that's just a good clinical question, right? Tell me when it happens, what it's like, exactly what it's like, where do you feel it? And then in her case, most importantly, when do you feel it? When did you first feel it the first time? And when do you get it? And what do you think she said? Oh, it's interesting. I get it every couple of weeks, but I always get it after I get off the phone with my mom. Think that might be related? So I talked to her about her mom. She had a very abusive mother, physically abusive, neg emotionally neglectful. The mother's now elderly. She feels, and she's done a lot of work. She's a quite spiritually evolved woman. She wants to be in touch with her mom because she feels that's her duty as a daughter, even though she had a lousy relationship with her mom. But every time she talks to her, she gets off the phone and she just can't digest what happened because her mom continues to be mean to her on the phone to actually compile the damage that she did. So we agree that her treatment plan was to not talk to her mom for a little while, not permanently. Um, and I saw her two months later and she had no pain, no pain. So then we started talking about what she could do in terms of developing boundaries because she's someone who didn't want to just cut her mother off. Um, and she did. she did. She went to therapy. She did some emotional work. She set boundaries around those conversations. And now she talks to her mom and she still has no abdominal pain. It's been about a year and a half. So her body was actually talking to her. She was having symptoms. She still has gallstones, but she doesn't have cholecystitis right? Her body was telling her something's not quite right, and she just needed to listen. So how do we help our patients access their body intelligence? Here are some of the questions that I ask. Describe your symptoms in detail, especially the context. How did it initially happen? What do you think is causing your symptoms? Great question. People often know. If you really listen to yourself, what do you know is the best way for you to heal? And then what keeps you from doing what you know you need to do? Very important, that last one, especially when we're talking about lifestyle stuff. This is another patient of mine. This is a 33-year-old nurse who comes to see me for a new patient visit. I walk in. She's got on those kind of uh, large yoga pants. And she lifts them up. And she's got weeping red eczema, eczema rashes all over her legs. It looks horrible. She's also got them all over her arms. And I say, wow. When did this start? And here's the story she tells me. 18 months prior to our appointment, she was living across the country. She was in a relationship with a man who she was wildly attracted to, but was somewhat complex. Couldn't decide whether to stay with him, and then she got pregnant. So they talked about it, couldn't decide what to do. They, she finally decides, I'm going to give it a go. They decide to move in together. She leaves her apartment. They're getting ready to move in together, and they're making love on the bed and she's lying on her back, and she reaches behind her, and under the pillow, she touches a used condom. You can't make this stuff up, right? And he's having an affair, and she leaves him, and she has nowhere to live, and so she goes to a friend's basement where she, she proceeds to have a spontaneous abortion um, and be in deep grief, and she moves to California. She does a little bit better when she gets there. She gets a job as a nurse. She joins a spiritual community where she engages with not one of the leaders, but one of the other people in the spiritual community who says to her, you know, I really feel like that man was an important person from a past life that you need to make peace with. And she listens to him. 
So she invites the guy out. He comes to California. He moves in with her. They're living in this little uh, apartment up in the Redwoods. And she starts to get horrendous allergy symptoms. Never had them in her life. Her eyes are so red, she gets in a corneal abrasion from itching them. She's a nurse. She's getting tons of medical help. So she's on nasal inhalers for her sneezing. She's on eye drops. She develops asthma. She's on steroid inhalers. She's on albuterol. She's really kind of a mess. So far, no rashes. Three months after he moves in, she starts to feel bad, like she has the flu and have back pain. And she goes in and she has a kidney infection, which we know can happen when you're sexually active. But it doesn't go away with the antibiotics. She goes back. She actually has PID. And she has both chlamydia and gonorrhea. So he is still cheating on her. And her body is trying to tell her something, is it not? Right? Her pelvis is saying in a very loud voice, no, not this guy, right? Not this one. So she finally uh, kicks him out. But unfortunately, now she's got a round of antibiotics for the kidney infection. She's got two more rounds of antibiotics for the pelvic inflammatory disease. In the meantime, she's seen an allergist. Looks like she's allergic to dust mites, dogs, and cats. Her food allergy from the allergist, positive for beef. She kicks the guy out. Immediately, her eyes get better and her asthma gets better. So I'm telling you a clinical story. It's kind of like the last lecture we had, but from the storytelling side, right? So all of the immunomodulating effects of those emotions happen and she's telling us what's going on physiologically, and these are the kinds of stories we hear, right? So she does a little better, but she starts to get rashes after taking all the antibiotics. And the rashes get worse and worse and worse, and she, in fact, has cellulitis three times with fevers, almost gets hospitalized, more antibiotics, two courses of oral prednisone, three shots of IM prednisone. She's still a mess, that's when she comes to see me. So. The first question I ask her is, what is your body trying to tell you? <laughs> She's very clear that this guy was a terrible idea, but that she also struggles with boundaries in all of her life. And I always think the body is such a beautiful metaphoric uh, site, right? So she has trouble with boundaries, but instead of setting them out in the real world and saying no, her immune system is angry and fighting on the inside, right? So we got her counseling and support about boundary making. I took her off of all the topical stuff she was doing because people can be sensitive to just about anything. We started her on some general natural anti-inflammatories, omega-3s. We talked about an anti-inflammatory diet. We took her off of beef because she's IgE positive. And I did a broader food allergy, food sensitivity, and gut health test. I stole this slide from Patrick Hannaway, um, who some of you may know. He's a really brilliant uh, GI specialist, but it's just such a great slide. Um, and when you're talking about the GI tract, I always tell my patients when I'm trying to explain the gut microbiome, your body is a donut, right? This is your outside skin. And between your mouth and your anus is your inside skin, just like a donut. And when you in interact with the environment, your skin interacts, but your inside skin interacts as well. And what we put in our mouths determines our inside environment. So we've, I know that there was a lecture on gut microbiome. Our last speaker talked about it, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time here hugely important. I think if I had to use one tool in my office, it would be gut work. Um, here's the cell junctions that get leaky when there is inflammation in the gut from parasites, from bacterial overgrowth, from yeast overgrowth, from food allergy, from food sensitivity. Here is how that flow works. Um, you are exposed to whatever the allergenic food or toxin is, stress as we were discussing in the last lecture, dysbiotic organisms, we get increased permeability, and then we get an increased inflammatory reaction and more reactions to the benign proteins in the lumen, the foods that we eat. And we get allergic autoimmune and other systemic uh, pathologic issues. All those hundred trillion friends in your gut. This is actually back from 2005, but already saying there will be the medicine of the future will include specific microbiota testing. Some of it's already available, but not widely available. So this is her microbiome analysis. This is looking at her short-chain fatty acid production, um, which is not bad, actually. There's just an imbalance of the types of short-chain fatty acids she's making. 
And then you can see at the very bottom, the beta-glucuronidase is extremely high. Some of you might be familiar with this. It is a, uh, an enzyme produced by gut bacteria that clips the glucuronal group off of estrogen and puts it back into circulation as activated estradiol through intrahepatic circulation. Um, so someone with a high level like this, first of all, probably means she has bacterial overgrowth, and secondly, puts her at risk for uh, high estrogen issues like uh, endometriosis, uterine fibroids, cancer. So here are her actual bacteria. This is a genetic labeling test. She was just talking about, about bacteroidetes during our last uh, lecture. Here she has uh, a, quite a bit of bacteroides, actually, in comparison. So the other thing, important thing to keep in mind when you look at these all day is that it's not the absolute numbers that matter. What matters is the balance between the organisms. And she has, you know, reasonable numbers of bacteroides, but what we notice is if we go down in this area, you can look at her lactobacillus, and it's in the second quintile, as opposed to the bacteroides, which is off the charts here. And then again, looking further, her bifido is terrible really low um, bifidobacteria, and again, a little bit of bacterial overgrowth of a few other species. And you can tell by that ratio at the bottom, again, we have bacterial overgrowth. This is the culture. I, like, I love to see these um, side by side because lactobacillus doesn't grow most of the time on these cultures, and it doesn't mean anything because it's a vulnerable organism. Um, but we know she has some lactobacillus, not a lot. And again, bifido should be three or four, a little bit low. She doesn't, amazingly, given all the antibiotics and steroids, she doesn't have unusual bacteria and she doesn't have yeast. So at her second visit, she comes back to see me. She's doing a little bit better in terms of her rash, not a lot better. We talk about the gut testing, low lactobacillus, low bifido. She's got bacterial overgrowth. Her food allergy and food sensitivity testing comes back. Now, not to be controversial, but Food sensitivity testing, I think of as a suggestion. Um, it varies lab to lab. It varies depend on, depending on what you're eating. It's not the same as an IgE test. I know there's lots of people who say they have very accurate IgG testing. I do it all the time because it's so darn clinically useful, like in this case. Um, but I use it as a reason to do an elimination diet to tell me what to eliminate. So she's positive on her IgE. So I retested her IgE because I wanted a broader food allergy test. The last one was just nine different things. This one is uh, 97. And she was allergic to both beef and dairy, IgE. And she was food sensitive to egg and citrus. So here was the plan. We put her on uh, multiple herbs to reduce bacterial overgrowth, followed by high dose probiotics and prebiotic foods and fermented foods. So we will have better ways to supplement the microbiome in the future, but currently we have very limited probiotics. Um, the prebiotics are essential here. So there was a crossover study where they put one group of patients on an egg, meat, and dairy diet, and they put the other group of patients on a high vegetable fiber vegetarian diet. And they measured their microbiome to start, they measured their microbiome after that intervention, Within three days, there was a dramatic reduction in the group eating eggs and dairy and meat, like 75% reduction in the number of bacteria in their microbiome. And then they did the switchover. And within another three days, those people who'd gone down to 25% were back up to 100% of what they started with. So the soluble fiber that we eat, she was mentioning Jerusalem artichoke and onions and garlic, but really vegetable fibers make an enormous difference in terms of the microbiome. I also uh, took her off of beef and dairy and then eggs and citrus. She is one of those people who loves essential oils. So she'd been using an orange oil topically on her eczema. And she'd been taking, uh, vaporizing it in the room so she actually had a lot of citrus exposure that was in fact making her sick. And then we put her on glutamine uh, to feed the intracytes and reduce inflammation as long, along with DGL or deglycerinized licorice and aloe. When I saw her back, almost 100% resolution of her rash. Almost 100%. She occasionally takes an antihistamine for allergies. And she was setting better boundaries at work and her, in her relationships and re required no medications. So 
I used my fancy tools with this patient, but none of it would have worked if she was still in the dysfunctional relationship. I told this story uh, to a group of physicians last week, and one of the women said, who's a dermatologist, said she had a patient with severe body psoriasis that she could not get rid of. They tried everything. She had her on a bunch of biologics and some you know, fairly intense medications. But as soon as she got out of her intense dis, uh, destructive marriage, all of her symptoms resolved, right? It's that stress effect that she was talking about with our immune system uh, during our less, last lecture. And if we don't identify what's going on for our patients in terms of their relationships, in terms of their social lives, we can't actually help them heal.